Hello and welcome. I'm Andreas Fertig. I work as a trainer and consultant primarily for C++. And I'm also the creator of C++ Insights. And this is also the tool I like to talk about in this series. I talked about coroutines in the last episode and highlighted that you have to be careful by having coroutines that take references. In this episode now, I want to look again at coroutines, but this time let's have a look how the state machine works. So let's say demystify coroutines a bit. So the code you're seeing here is from a presentation I gave at CppCon last year. Uh, it was about coroutines. So I put the link to the video in the description so you can also watch that one. It's a long talk. And I didn't use C++ insights there. So what do we have? I have my struct task here and that one contains a promise type. So today we look at potentially one of the well, codeless coroutines you can have in C++. Each coroutine comes with a promise type. So we have a wrapper type here that's task and that must contain a type called promise type. This is how coroutines work. It's mainly customization points. The compiler knows which names to look for and we provide the implementation, which in my case is um, yeah, really simple. So I have my promise type here inside task. And for my minimalistic example, I only provide a couple of customization points for my core team, for my promise type to be precise. So I provide get return object because this is something we can say it's a must. Uh, this tells the compiler how to construct the wrapper type which contains the promise type. So get return object here, I simply create a default created task object. This is for the compiler how to create the wrapper type. And then I have three additional customization points. One that's called initial suspend, where I return a default constructed suspend never. And I have a final suspend where I also return a suspend never. And then we have unhandled exception here. We also have the option to tell the compiler what to do when we hit a exception inside a coroutine. But that's beyond our scope for today. So what we model here, I have a scheduler and I'd like to schedule two tasks. So I'm creating two tasks, passing the scheduler, and then here I'm running the scheduler until all tasks are finished or my program ends by another way. We can see the two tasks here. So I name them task A and task B. Both take a scheduler by reference and they do simple things like shouting hello from task A, the other one always says B. And now here's the interesting part. I'm co-waiting for the scheduler. So this is one point where the task gives up control to the scheduler and the scheduler can decide how to continue, how to proceed. Once the coroutine gets resumed, it prints out another message, then co-waits again, and then prints out a final message. Okay, so this is our task at this point. And my scheduler here, it's not that much important for um, the rest. So my suspend function here, that one's once again reaching into the state machine of the coroutine. I create a struct awaiter here, and this time to spare a couple of lines and show you different things. I'm deriving from suspend always. My waiter here stores reference to a schedule object. And then I have a constructor for my waiter taking a scheduler, setting my reference. And then the only function I'm implementing from suspend always, or more precisely I'm overriding, is a wait suspend, taking the coroutine handle. And what it does is it pushes that handle in to the task list of my scheduler at a variant. This is the definition of my struct and then I'm returning a struct parsing a object of this, so by that a reference to this. It's C++ insights. So let's do the transformation here. 
I enabled show coroutine transformation, which is off by default. And you can also get this nice note here. Um, yeah, take the time and read it because this is a very special transformation at this point. So the first part of the transformation doesn't show anything interesting in particular. It's, it's simply differently formatted um, our task and promise type. It gets more interesting once we reach line 82 on the right. So there we can see something new. And this is my task A frame. Because coroutines in C++ are stackless, that means they are stored on the heap. And that means we're looking at the potentially heaviest source transformation we have in, in C++. Because the code on the right here, from line 43 to 54, for example, that all ends up on the right, becoming line 82 down to line 122. Okay, so let, let's start from the top. So the compiler applies heavy transformation to the usual C++ code from a coroutine we write. Because coroutines are stackless, the compiler needs to transform all local variables, including parameters, to no longer being on the stack, but instead being stored in something that's called the coroutine frame. And that's what you're seeing at the right here. And that stores more than simply the parameters and the variables of a function. So what you can first see here in line 84 is and 85 are two function pointers, resume and destroy. This is to invoke the resume or the destroy function of a coroutine. And then also in the coroutine frame is the promise type. Further, you can see here something that's called a suspend index. We will see that one later. And there's also a bool called initial await suspend called, which is also crucial. We will see that down the lines. Then you see also our parameter. That's the parameter of my task A here. And then we see a couple of things like suspend never, my awaiter, and another suspend never. So this is our coroutine frame. Okay, this is maintained, created, and so forth by the compiler. Now this here is the function task A. If you create a coroutine like here on the left in line 37, that's only the setup part. Because of the transformation the compiler applies, we can see here this is this all is, is the setup. Okay, the signature looks the same. Uh, it takes a scheduler object, it returns a task object. Now internally, the compiler allocates by using new and this here is Clang we are looking at. So they have a defined maximum coroutine size. So the compiler here allocates memory. That one gets then casted to a task frame. So this is what we saw before our coroutine. So this is here the coroutine frame. So now we have a allocated a coroutine frame. We have a pointer to it. First thing we set suspend index to zero. Await suspend called yet set to false. You know that from last time, all the parameters get forwarded or moved into the coroutine frame. The next thing, this here is constructing the promise type. So this is how we reach into our wrapper type for our promise type and constructing that one default construction by using placement new here. So that means it gets constructed directly in the coroutine frame. And this part now here, this is um, where we go from the task to the promise type. Now, next thing is before declare two functions we will see later, the resume and destroy functions for my coroutine we are looking at here. The function pointers get assigned and then there's the first call to task A, resume. So this is first starting or kicking the coroutine off for the first time. And then in line 122, we can see the get return object. So this matches this line on the left. Okay, this is how the compiler calls on my promise time get return object because 
the signature here says the task A returns a task object. This is how the compiler does this. We instructed how to do it. The task A resume function we see here uh, is much bigger than we might have expected. It takes a task frame pointer. This is mainly now the function I wrote with a couple of additions. So first of all, all the code is wrapped in a try catch because if a exception happens inside a coroutine, then mon needs to be called. We can see this um, down here. So it, the compiler ensures that every exception gets caught. And um, if it's not a coroutine that was already constructed, then an exception is thrown. And otherwise we call or the compiler calls unhandled exception. So this is my other customization point. As I said, I don't want to go into exceptions and coroutines today. But this is the mapping here. Now if we go up, this is the magic. So you can imagine there is a big switch case and that one is switching already suspend index. Remember, we started setting that one to zero. So here, the first call to task A resume brings us here, it directly leads to breaking out of the switch, leading us to get here. This is where the next customization point is called, this one here, initial suspend. So all this happens behind our backs, okay? This is part of my task A function here, calling initial suspend. So requesting what to do. And now we can see I said suspend never. So the compiler here now, or at runtime, your um, program asks, what is the status for this first suspension point if we call await ready? Are we ready to continue or not? If the answer would be no, then we would go inside this if. We would say await suspend. And here you can see that the compiler now is able to get the task handle and the promise type from an address here, it would be suspended. We set our suspend index to zero, uh, sorry, to one, and we say that initial suspend or initial await suspend was called. If we don't want to suspend this point, then we directly reach for the next one. Can see, yeah, it's not what we would write usually, go to's and labels. Well, this is roughly how you can imagine it's done inside the compiler. It's type safe or it's safe there because the compiler maintains all the state. So it's not up to us and the compiler can ensure that there is no duplicate label or things like that. So for resume task A1, the compiler here reaches into my suspension point from before and with await resume, we have a way to know that our coroutine gets resumed. Okay, so this is the purpose of this call. So we are in the progress of resuming. Get ready, get the values into the coroutine. Here we see the operator C out. So that's the first output from task A. Next thing is because I'm seeing a co wait here, or I've written a co wait here. This is what that one maps to. We can also see it, it comes from line 47. So the call wait means that I'm reaching for the scheduler stored in my coroutine frame calling suspend. This is not a coroutine function. This is the function we wrote in our scheduler here. So this is not a coroutine. This is the function we wrote in our scheduler suspend here. Because call wait here says scheduler suspend. This is what the compiler does. You can see here, when I say scat on the left, the compiler redirects that to scat in the coroutine frame. Okay, so everything is on the coroutine frame. Now, the result also gets assigned to the coroutine frame. Then the same thing happens as above. The compiler checks whether the awaiter here is ready or not. If not, coroutine gets suspended. This is how the compiler tells the coroutine in the await suspend what the handle of this coroutine is. It can suspend that one and the suspended part knows the handle, so it can resume it or do something with it. We do this or we facilitate that here. So this is where we take the coroutine handle and push it into the tasks list. 
to know later which task to resume. And of course, we have to maintain the suspend index, or better, the compiler does that for us. So now we reach suspension point number two. And that one definitely gets us out, because here at this point, the coroutine gets suspended. Once it gets resumed by this call here, which is quite hard to map to something on the right, then we can see we reach the label with the number two. The compiler once again, or the state machine, tells this specific suspension point that it now gets resumed. We see the output of C out here. And then we see the whole scenario again, line 51 here, getting another suspend called and the suspension point here, checking whether we are ready, suspending, telling the coroutine handle and updating the index. And finally, for one last time, if the label voice to number three gets, then the coroutine gets resumed. The output A is back doing more work. And then the coroutine heads over to the final suspend point. That one would be the one below here. And there, once again, compiler asks for a final suspend. So this is now our other customization point we implemented where we can say what to do and then the coroutine falls off the control flow here. This is why you should never invoke a coroutine that is done. So this is the rough mapping from our customization points and the source uh, transformation the compiler does to the internal versions of the compiler. Something that's really hard to show and, and this is why it's not here is the task resume because this is also a library function that's implemented in your standard library which resumes the coroutine. So it's a simple call reaching into the state machine of the compiler telling it to resume that coroutine and done here the first function would be the same it queries whether the coroutine is already done or not. So I hope that helps to understand a bit better how the code you write and all the customization points you have to provide maps to what a compiler does for us. So enjoy coroutines. That's it for today. Stay tuned for the next episode. Bye bye.